delay is one of the most important characteristics of digital circuits. We can use an RC circuit model to provide us with valuable information and insight. Our model for the CMOS transistor is relatively simple given the complex physics of modern devices. Even so, that model is too complicated for many logic design tasks. So to analyze delay, we'll use an even simpler model, a switched resistor. We use a resistor to model the current production of the transistor. We use the switch to model turning on and off the transistor with the gate voltage. So here's the drain current curve for the transistor. The linear saturation boundary divides the current characteristic into two parts. We want a single value for the resistance of the transistor. We'll generate that using two different resistances, one for each of these regions. In the case of the saturation region, we'll put a point at the middle of the curve in the saturation region. The line between the origin and that point gives us the resistance. The slope of that line is 1 over the resistance, which we'll call the saturation resistance. In the case of the linear region, we'll put a point in its middle. We'll draw a line to develop the resistance of that region. Then we'll find the average resistance of the transistor by averaging these two resistance values, R sat and R lin. We can analyze these two resistance values using our models for the transistor. For the linear region, we can write formulas for the voltage and the current in the linear region. We can do the same thing in the saturation region. We can then take the ratio of each voltage to current in order to find the linear and saturation resistances, and then average the two to find the effective resistance of the transistor. We will use the term RT for a generic transistor effective resistance, RN for an N-type, and RP for a P-type. Remember that current scales with L over W. Remember that current increases as we increase the width, so the resistance will decrease. Effective resistance scales with L over W. Here are some example values for the effective resistance of a P-type and an N-type transistor. The P-type transistor's transconductance is considerably smaller than the N-types, which means that its effective resistance is higher. These plots show how the transistor effective resistance varies with two parameters. The left-hand plot shows how it varies with a threshold voltage. And we can see that increasing the threshold voltage increases the transistor's effective resistance. The right-hand plot shows the variation in effective resistance with transconductance. As we increase the transistor's transconductance, its effective resistance goes down. Now that we know the effective resistance of our transistor, we can use it in an RC circuit model. The output of a logic gate is connected to the next logic gate. The transistors in that logic gate contribute to the load capacitance on the preceding gate. Here we have an inverter at the output. Its two transistors, the pull up and the pull down, determine the load capacitance on the first inverter. That load capacitance is the sum of the transistor gate capacitances of the next inverter. That load capacitance doesn't depend on whether those transistors are on and off. They always contribute to the load capacitance. Now we can build a circuit model for the inverter using our switched effective resistances and the load capacitance. The input voltage of the inverter controls the switches of both the pull-up and the pull-down transistors. We can further simplify our circuit model by assuming that only one transistor is on at a time. This allows us to concentrate, for example, in the case of a falling transition in the red part of the circuit. So here's our circuit model. We have a switch determining when the circuit action starts. We have an effective resistance for the transistor. And we have the load capacitance. 
now we can start to analyze the voltage waveforms. An analogy that we often use to understand the operation of the inverter circuit is filling a swimming pool from a water tower. The size of the pool determines its capacity. The height of the water tower above the pool is equivalent to the voltage that the, that the, the height of the water tower above the swimming pool is equivalent to voltage in our circuit. And the water flowing through the pipe from the water tower into the pool is equivalent to current. We'll give the inverter a step input. We'll turn on the pull down transistor. This will cause the pull down resistor to discharge the load capacitance and decrease the output voltage over time. We can write equations to analyze this waveform. The voltage across the power supply is the sum of the transistor resistance times the current plus the capacitor voltage. We know from the capacitor law the current through the capacitor. We can plug that into our original formula and then we can integrate to find the output voltage as a function of time. The result is an exponential. Time is divided by the product of the transistor resistance and the load capacitance. We call that product the time constant. We can use several metrics to talk about this waveform. We use the term delay for 0 to 50 or in the case of a transition in the other direction 50 to 0 percent time. Since this allows us to measure time relative to the time constant, we can substitute that into our formula and find that the delay is equal to 0.69 times the time constant. We use the term rise or fall or transition time to talk about 10 to 90 percent or 90 to 10 percent delays. In this case, the rise fall time is equal to 2.2 times the time constant. Here are some examples for a simple circuit. We can see that rise fall time and delay give us different values. Each has its uses in different circuit situations. This plot compares the RC waveform from our very simple model to a more complicated model of the inverter simulated with the SPI circuit simulator. We can see that even though our RC model is very simple, it agrees with the inverter detailed model fairly well. Circuit designers choose the widths and lengths of their transistors. We can use transistor sizing to control the balance between delay and power consumption. The transistor's channel is defined by its width and its length. The effective resistance of the transistor depends upon the ratio of its length to its width. As we increase the width of the transistor, the current increases and its effective resistance goes down. In, the, in digital, we don't often increase the length, but if we did, the effective resistance would go up. So the transistor effective resistance is inversely proportional to its width. This plot shows the relationship between delay and transistor W over L for a simple example. As we increase the width of the transistor, the delay of the inverter goes down. The transconductance of a p-type transistor is lower than that of the n-type transistor. That means the p-type transistor's effective resistance will be higher. That means, in turn, that the rise time for the inverter will be longer than its fall time. If we want to make the rise time and the fall time equal, we need to make the p-type transistor wider. We make it wider in proportion to the ratio of the transconductances of the n-type and the p-type. Of course that has its costs. As we make the p-type transistor wider, we increase its gate capacitance, which means in turn that we increase the load capacitance for the previous transistor. This brings us to the question of how we might drive very large loads. The natural example for this is driving the output to the entire chip which connect to the physical world, but there are many other examples on chip also. So here's a chain of inverters. We have a small inverter 
whose gate capacitance is C1, and they're ultimately driving a large capacitor C big. Let's make the ratio of the sizes of transistors from one inverter to the next equal to alpha. This formula gives us the delay through the entire inverter chain. We minimize that. We can find that the optimum number of stages to drive this large load is equal to the logarithm of the ratio of the in output to the input capacitance and that ratio of sizes from one to the next is equal to E. This is an example this is an example of exponential tapering of impedances, a concept that incurs many times in the natural world. To review, we model the CMOS inverter as a switched resistor driving a capacitive load. We calculate the effective resistance of the transistor using the transistor characteristics. The resulting waveform of the inverter is an exponential rising in the case of a 0 to 1 transition, falling in the case of a 1 to 0 transition. Transistor sizing allows us to trade off delay and power consumption.